Madam. Madam Parik, Manda Parik, Your Excellencies, friends. When I left my home in France Tuesday morning, I took with me the photo of Ramlal that I have above my writing table. Ramlal, I'm looking at you every day, and you're looking back. My friend, my colleague, my father, my brother. You were born on 18 April 1927, three and a half years before me. But you know, three and a half years play a big role at that age. So I just recognize you as my elder. And it's a great honor and pleasure for me to give this 10th memorial address. My speech you already have in front of you. It hasn't changed the last 10 years. I found it absolutely remarkable that even when my wife and I were paying allegiance to the white tiger, Ramlal was there. He was at any place. He was the multiple Indian, the multiple Gandhian. Ramlal, I just simply continue loving you, and I thank the good fortune that brought me in contact with you. My topic, as you know, is state and non-state terrorism. Terrorism is a political tactic. It is known to kill not only civilians, but to kill children, women, old people, anybody. And as a political tactic, the usual goal of that is strategic. It's to have the people stand up against the system. It almost invariably fails because of sloppy thinking, bad understanding of the human psyche. What happens is that people stand up against the terrorists, whether they are governmental or not. Whether they're not this Naxalite or the governmental would be Indian Air Force unmanned aircraft that now seem to be in the coming. I'm against both of them, and I share Ramlal's idea how much further they could have come had they been fighting nonviolently. Terrorism kills upwards, state terrorism kills downwards. As most of the people in command of society are high up, they are much more afraid of terrorism. And they often encourage the state terrorism as the appropriate response. That's not very Gandhian. The Gandhian response would be, yeah, what would it be? It would, of course, be Ahimsa. But that's too broad. So what I get as the basic response formulated in not necessarily Gandhian language, but the drier language of conflict and peace studies, is two responses. Point one, identify the underlying conflict. Point two, solve it, please. Violence is a sign of a conflict not resolved. Violence is to that conflict like smoke to fire. You don't like smoke? Try to do something about the fire. We have a profession of smoke specialists called journalists. They are trained to identify smoke. And whenever there is a smoke signal arising, you can be quite sure that a gang of them will be there reporting the thickness of the smoke. We who are working for peace journalism encourage the journalists always to ask two questions. 
or whatever prime minister or president or whoever it is comes out to deplore the violence and to blame the violators. Mr. President, what's the underlying conflict? And Mr. President, what's your program for solving that conflict? If India likes Naxalites, go ahead with unmanned aircraft. They will find an answer. There is imagination on both sides, as we know perfectly well human beings are capable of imagination. A terrorist is defined as a person with a bomb without an airplane. Let us say an improvised explosive device, an IED, for your information, it costs $10 to make one. $10 with the value of the dollar today, sinking value, I think you should quote it in euros, rather. I'm afraid there's too much pegging or repeat to the dollar. So about six euros. It's not very much. You don't need any financial resource to be able to do that. A state terrorist is a guy with a plane with a bomb in it. What was new about 9-11 was to use the plane as a bomb. It was creative. The human creativity, sky is the limit. So if you wanted to continue, just continue the violence game. If you like violence so much, just continue. I would advise, identify the conflict, go into it. So how do I go into 9-11? I first pay attention to the fact that of the 19 perpetrators, 15 were Saudi Arabs. So I don't find it highly intelligent, but I was praised for that, very foresighted, it was said that I said that maybe there's something about the United States and Saudi Arabia. Maybe. If 15 of them, young people, are willing to give their lives for something, maybe something is burning somewhere. Maybe it's even something they have tried to communicate. And maybe violence is the desperate effort to communicate to somebody, often associated with the mantra, violence is the only language they understand. So what is it then? Well, I would go back to March 1945. And then I would make a jump to August 1990 and 91. So what happened? And here I may be telling you nothing new, also something new. You live in a country which is almost deprived of international news. You have a newspaper that starts with about 10 pages about the city, then goes on to the state, and finally there's something called a global page, usually with very badly selected news. I think India should be ashamed of being so badly informed as it is. So what I say may be nothing new, it may be new, but in March 1945, Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed a contract with Ibn Saud, a treaty which gave almost unlimited access to oil of the Arab Peninsula, the part under Saudi control. That had been happening for some time, but this time it was formalized. And the second part of the treaty was that the United States obligated itself to come to the defense of the royal house if it were attacked by its own people. Now, maybe some alarm bells should have been ringing at that point. They didn't ring. Did anybody care to find out what Wahhabism is about? The national religion of Saudi Arabia. A Puritan branch of the Sunni branch of Islam, very similar to Puritanism one century earlier, as a branch of the Protestant branch of Christianity. Now, Wahhabism's basic doctrine was that the Arabs had a chosen people living in a promised land, as evidenced by the fact that it was to Muhammad that Gabriel addressed the message of the Quran. And when Muhammad died, 
he uttered the idea that there should be no two religions in this country. Now, about all of this, you may have your opinions. I may have mine. It doesn't matter very much what we think. What matters is what Wahhabs think. You may be so uninterested in it that you don't even know it. You may be a George Bush when he attacked Iraq. 19 March 2003, didn't even know that there was a difference between Shias and Sunnis. But you may say he's a little bit, or was a little bit, exceptional. So, you go into it. And you pay attention, or you should have paid attention, to the fact that the good life, according to Wahhabism, was the life as lived by the Prophet. Now, the Prophet had been working as a very, very militant fighter for the revelation he had received in Mecca and was working as a patriarch running a little city-state in Medina. Very different from Jesus Christ. He was a politician. Now, that makes a difference. Because it means a lot of ideas about how the good society should be run. And as you all know, the Quran is divided into the Mecca part and the Medina part. Now, what then happens is that you twist and thwart that country into something irrecognizable, bringing in Jews and Christians, soldiers. You make a lifestyle, a style of living that, of course, many Saudi Arabians loved. Materialism. Individualist materialism or material individualism. Very far away from the basic idea of Islam, togetherness and sharing. The togetherness of the shahada, the salat. The sharing of the zakat and the Ramadan and the togetherness again of the Ummah, the community of believers of the Hajj. You just don't pay any attention to it. And you top that by using Saudi Arabia as your staging base for attack on another Arab Islamic country, Iraq. After Iraq atrociously attacked Kuwait, after England atrociously detached Kuwait and made it an enclave for their own oil purposes in 1898. You have a mixed history in that region. Now, the signals were very clear, and Saudi Arabia became a country divided among itself. Right through the royal house goes the dividing line. And the United States desperately trying to preserve its bridge hold. While at the same time exploring other possibilities of getting oil. And greedily, of course, looking for the Caspian oil and for the possibility of a pipeline to Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan. It should be Muslim free, as if there were no Muslims in those countries. But the basic point, it should be Russia free and China free. So you have oil in your, on your mind and you get into problems and you try to solve those problems by appealing to hearts and minds, forgetting that if you shall appeal to hearts and minds, you have to have those commodities yourself. If you are short on them, maybe your appeal doesn't reach the audience. Now. What do, I, what do I draw from this? First of all, I draw from this a colossal U.S. lie perpetrated on humankind that all of this was concocted in Afghanistan. It was concocted at a technical high school in Hamburg. It was activated in a pilot school in the U.S. I must say myself that if I should execute extrajudicially two buildings, if 
for having sinned against Allah. I'm not sure they would plan it in a cave in Afghanistan. I would use a cave in Afghanistan to train people to fight in Chechnya. And, ladies and gentlemen, in Kashmir. I wouldn't use it for the purposes of extrajudicial execution of two buildings. One of them a key building in the US economic empire with two towers. And one of them a key building in the US military empire. There was a third building on the list. If you have four planes and you need two for one of them because of the twin tower idea. And I am fairly certain that third building was CAA in Langley, Virginia. It's not the relationship between Afghanistan and the US. It's a relationship between, let us say, one half of Saudi Arabia <coughs> and the United States of America. How do you approach that? Let us say that you now want a nonviolent approach. You want to build peace. Well, you don't start killing Afghans. That's an obvious first answer. But we need something more positive. And the landscape of peace is divided into three parts, the past, the present, and the future. What you do for the past is conciliation. What you do for the present is mediation. What you do for the future is cooperation. Conciliation, mediation, cooperation. You would, of course, immediately have a historical commission appointed, a truth commission, to look at what happened in 1945, to look at the reflection or lack thereof on the Saudi Arab side and on the Washington side. That commission would, of course, not only have Western scholars, it would have Muslim scholars. Arab scholars. And you would look askance across the Atlantic and you would encourage the UK to do the same for the Sykes Picot treason in 1915 and try to find out what happened. Of course, when you look into history, it starts thinking. You have to be prepared for that. But the basic point is that you are willing to acknowledge that something happened that maybe should not have happened. Maybe it was utterly unwise. Maybe it was due to the fact that FDR was drunk with oil because oil was such, a, such an important factor in the Second World War. It's not the only one. So you look into the past. How do you look into the present? Well, you have a war on terror going on. It has very many places around the world. You have perpetrated a lie on the world that this was concocted in Afghanistan. You have the follow-up idea, namely that if Afghanistan becomes a failed state, Al-Qaeda, will be welcomed. To this, a former British foreign minister has recently said, point one, the proof that this came from Afghanistan is missing. And point two, there are many places in the world where Al-Qaeda maybe could find a base. Point three, Maybe security is best enhanced at home. You build it at home, not in any place you want to attack for whatever reason. And if you now are at war against four Islamic nations, the Palestinians, why are your accomplice Israel? Of course, in addition to that, Iraq, in addition to that, Pakistan, in addition to that, Afghanistan. And you have a number fifth on the target, promising to blow it into smithereens should they develop a nuclear capacity, Iran. 
and you're starting talking about Yemen and Somalia. Don't be surprised if somebody gets the idea that you are at war against Islam. Don't be surprised. Of course, there are 57 countries, members of the Organization of the Islamic Conference, one of them being India. You're having the second biggest contingent of Muslims. Again, I say, there are many countries to go. If you are focused on Islamic candidates, you have, of course, still 52 to target on. I don't think you'll make it. President Obama, who has come out, not in words, but in facts, a little bit to the right of George Bush, because he's much more active, nevertheless did one, in my view, very positive thing. He said in a speech that we were behind the toppling of a legally elected prime minister and a legally elected parliament in Iran, Mossadr, in 1953. He could have shared the honor, it was not only CIA, it was also MI6, an old friend of India, and could have shared the honor. He didn't apologize, but since I worked quite a lot on reconciliation, I would not attach that much importance to it. It's the acknowledging act. Yes, we did it. He could have added, I wish it were undone. Would have been becoming. That could come later. It had an immediate effect. Suddenly Iran was available for negotiations. What then happened in Geneva is another chapter. But you see, the moment you're willing to admit something and you don't deny it, you may open for something. So the mediation would then consist in the following. It would, of course, consist in withdrawing from Afghanistan. And I then come now immediately to Afghanistan. But I've also said that there is a future part to it, a cooperative part. And that cooperative part, in my view, would be for the biggest importer of oil to sit down with the biggest exporters of oil, Saudi Arabia and potentially Iran, trying to develop a plan for a 5% cut per year over 20 years, or 3% over 33 years, whatever, it, and a corresponding development of green technology, not leaving all of that to China. China is today producing green technology, just like Hu Jintao said at the 17th Party Congress in October 2007, and will put it to work in their own country and at the same time have a hefty economic growth based on exporting green technology. Somebody else could have done that. Somebody else did not do it. If you look at Gandhian economics, it's green from the very beginning. It's fascinating that this country produced one of the biggest geniuses in human history, whereupon the country turns its back to its own product. So having said that, I have outlined an approach. That approach presupposes dialogue. It presupposes that you speak the unspeakable, you listen to the inaudible, you hear the unpleasant, and you simply sit down at one point and you talk with Al-Qaeda, and you talk with Taliban, and you talk with Hamas, and you talk with Hezbollah. I've done all four. I've even gone so far as to talk with the State Department. In other words, there's no limit. Terrorism and state terrorism. And what do I ask as a mediator? Let me just pick up one example. I ask somebody in Hamas, is there an Israel you can imagine recognizing? And the guy high up in that system says, of course. But it's not the present Zionist Israel with unlimited expansion. So I say it is something like 4 June 1967. And he said, it is something like that. But there are some 
points that have to be clarified. But it is in that direction. And Professor Galtung, if you don't mind, we are not going to reveal our political negotiation agenda to you right now. Thank you. Perfectly okay with me. In other words, it's an utter lie to assume that they want Israel into the Mediterranean. But they want a more modest Israel. And I can share with you the transcend since I've been working on that conflict since 1964, which is, I must say, a little bit much. Our vision of peace in the Middle East is a Middle East community. <clears> of <throat> Israel with the five neighboring Arab states. Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Palestine, and the arrogant Egypt. Just like you have at the Treaty of Rome, which started 1st of January 58, you have the former Nazi Germany with Benelux, Italy, and the arrogant France. A glittering success accommodating one of the most atrocious powers in European history. And when I give this kind of talk in Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, New York, Chicago, Miami, Los Angeles, I know exactly what the response is. Aha, you are comparing us to Nazi Germany. And I say, yes, because you are difficult to digest. There has to be an integrative move. You have to declare limits to your expansion, you have to declare contraction, willingness of coexistence. And if two Arab presidents came out with an invitation to you to join them in a family of the Middle East, it would help. Now, this is future music, it's futurism. And it's the idea in mediation of making a compelling vision. Gandhiji had a compelling vision. It was not only Swaraj. It was a Swaraj where there could be more Britons than under colonial occupation, but as friends and equals. He had a vision of freedom and equity. Now, the compelling vision may have to be stated some time in advance and you then furnish it with details. And you move the mediation into the future by imaging cooperative acts. Washington has enough talented people. United States has enough brilliant, innovative people to do that and could do it. So, since two Saturdays ago, I'm engaged in mediation with the Pentagon General. He's about as desperate about the war as I am. Belongs to the profession of a mediator, never to tell names. So the point about it is this. To get into the phase similar to the end of the Vietnam War, when conferences started taking the upper hand, and we have one scheduled for mid-February. How much comes out of it, I don't know. It's a conference about future conferences. And that brings us immediately to a basic point. How about Afghanistan? Professor Galtung, you have told about something about the US and Saudi Arabia. But here we have Afghanistan. Transcend our organization for mediation. Had a mediation in February 2001 in Peshawar. The country was under Taliban control. In the room were 30 sheikhs, 30 former cabinet members, 30 useless professors, and 10 wonderful ladies. And when I started complimenting the ladies, my interlocutor, who was translating to me from Dari and Pashtun, 
kicked my leg and say, don't say too many compliments about the ladies, the men cannot take it. So I stood corrected. We went on for one week. And out came a five-point plan. Coalition government with Taliban, with a former cabinet minister saying that Taliban are the moral nerve of our country. If they are not in it, it will all be heroin and corruption. It doesn't mean that the Taliban do not also occasionally make use of heroin to get some money for those $10 a bomb. But they were also the ones that cut heroin production down to zero. He said, 100% Taliban is intolerable. 0% is stupid. So I said, how about 20? He said, 18. I said, 19. So these are tough bargaining stances, as you understand. It can be done with a little bit of humor, too. It's entirely possible. We went on, point two. Afghanistan is not and will never be a unitary state run from Kabul. A loose federation. There's something to learn from India about linguistic federalism. Of course, you haven't managed the Northeast, Assam, Nagaland, etc. But what India has achieved in that regard is remarkable. The possibility of Afghanistan moving in the same direction is a major force of the war. It's not only Taliban fighting secularism, but it is also the locals fighting Kabul and Karzai. The third point is a Central Asian community. There are Tajiks in Tajikistan and Afghanistan, Uzbek in Uzbekistan and Afghanistan. There are Dari person speaking in Iran and Afghanistan. Pashto divided between Pakistan and Afghanistan, with Waziristan in between. It all belongs together. Who drew the dividing lines? Well, that one can talk about. Many of them were drawn like the Duran line by Westerners. Afghanistan is surrounded by eight Muslim countries. A Central Asian community would be interesting. Maybe India would think it's a little bit too big. But there are those who think that India is a little bit too big. That idea is not shared by Indians. I don't share it either. I admire the Indian Union, but it is a slightly big. So something big next to it might be becoming for both. Point four, basic needs as basic for politics. Basic needs means food and clothing and housing. It means health and education for both genders. India is moving ahead on the birth gender faction. You don't have to go that long back in Indian history or in European to find the opposite. Afghanistan is maybe the most retrograde of all the Muslim countries. And when I talk to them about that in my countless visits to Afghanistan, they say we know this, perfectly aware of it. But we are not going to be told that from Americans and from feminists, and particularly not by American feminists. Will they please stay at home? They have enough to do at home. We want to know it from Indonesia, from Turkey, from southern Philippines. And we'll be moving. Point five, security in a country with a very violent culture. And the security has to be based on not, this, not NATO, certainly not USA. Not even the Security Council alone, because there is no Muslim power, nor is there a Hindu power. Security Council is a historical museum from 1945 and should be placed where other museums belong. You can even have a room for it someplace. 
the Organization of the Islamic Conference in cooperation with the Security Council. All of that is entirely feasible. So there is no way of saying that Afghanistan is not a knot of problems. But most of those problems can be solved, and by Afghans principally. An organization for the security and cooperation of Central Asia modeled on the organization for security and cooperation in Europe would be a good idea. I'll tell you one little story about what happened during this mediation. <clears throat> I've given you the five points. Actually, two stories. The first one was a former prime minister who came up to me and said, it's the best formula I have seen, he said. There's only one problem about it, it won't happen. So I said, will you elaborate? And he said, yes. And this was in February 2001. The Americans are going to attack us in October. They did attack in October, of course, using 9-11 as pretext, since American foreign policy is a stew based on a pretext soup and some base being hard nut politics. They're right now using your country for their purposes. I have a book here called The Fall of the U.S. Empire and Then What? I just mentioned it in passing, since I think by year 2020 it will be over. And in 1980, I predicted the fall of the Soviet Empire, and then what? Within 10 years, and it happened. But leaving that aside, he said they're going to attack because they want a pipeline and they want basis for a possible future war with China. Those are, of course, the basic purposes. The rest is pretext. But as we were discussing all of this, two gentlemen stood up. Afghan gentlemen with glowing eyes and they started reading themselves for a fist fight. It was just a part of the culture of violence. And I decided that time has now come for me to do something. So I took off my spectacles and jumped back. Now I'll tell you the trick of the story. They became like sheep, like lambs. The trick of the story is that <coughs> You put it in the pocket and things like that. In other words, you can signal it that I think you, there may be a little bit of something, I'm not afraid of it, but glass in the eyes, unkind. So if you are remediated, buy spectacles, that is the idea. <laughs> and you can just have ordinary glass in it, that doesn't matter. But this little thing here is indispensable. I've given you a touch of what to me is common sense, and thereby winning hearts and minds can only arise in a mind that is mindless and a heart that is heartless. To save the U.S., get out. But there are a couple of things to do. It is not just a question of pulling out. I've now indicated something that has to do with solving the relationship to Arabia and the relationships in Afghanistan. I have in this book called 50 Years, 100 Conflicts, where I've been more or less active, actually quite active. I have a list of the 26 major Western crimes against Islam since 1830. Now, are we supposed to believe that they should just take it hands down and just say, well, you know, these were God-inspired countries and some of them were democracies, and it's such a fantastic honor to be attacked and colonized by a democracy. Oh, we really just should prostrate ourselves and be grateful. Well, they don't take it like that. The problem about 9-11 is not to explain it, but to try to explain why it didn't happen earlier. Let me come closer to home. There is Indian state terrorism in Kashmir and has been going on for a long time. Is there any solution to Kashmir? I have been working on it. 
And what I say is certainly up for discussion. But let me mention three points. Let us say there are seven parts of Kashmir, and let us say that I address only four of them. And imagine that Azad Kashmir goes to Pakistan and Jammu and Ladakh to the Indian Union. As states. Point one. Point two, the valley under an Indo Pak authority, aiming at ever higher levels of independence or autonomy, maybe even independence, should not be the end of the world. But then comes point three, and that's the interesting one. Point three is a Kashmir Federation with open borders of Azad Kashmir, Jammu, Ladakh, and the valley, and the others. Where everybody is a part of a federal but not unitary Kashmir. And where Ladakh and Jammu and Azad Kashmir have a double status. At the same time, parts of a union and parts of Pakistan, part of Pakistan with a line of control being de facto recognized as more than that, the LOC. And that this federation is an other reality, so there is a double reality which could ex be expressed in a passport. Where you have the Islamic Republic of Pakistan, Kashmir. The Indian Union, Kashmir. Would that expose people to an identity problem? I don't think so. I think they could take it. And I think it would cost less to have some typographical change of passports than continue the present madness. I know that in both foreign ministries there have been the idea of sitting waiting for the other country to collapse. I know that. And I also know that right now New Delhi has the upper hand when it comes to the collapse race. I've been to Rawalpind in the days when they were hoping and waiting for the Indian collapse. And it's a little bit like Washington hoping for North Korea's collapse. They've been hoping 60 years so far. They're probably still hoping. And it's not a very fruitful approach in a conflict. Now, it may be the country will collapse, but maybe recognizing it will actually promote the collapse. Maybe the lack of recognition is the one that keeps them together. So there's not much, much wisdom in it. So instead of that, imagine a Kashmir Area Free Trade Association, a CAFTA. Free travel all over, open borders. And at the same time, giving to Pakistan something, to India something, and to Kashmir very much serving three masters at the same time. There are many things to discuss here. There is a certain glacier. Internationalize the glacier, make it a glacier monument to peace. It's going to disappear anyhow, so it's the, by, by global warming. Naxalites. I have no difficulty imagining the Naxalite revolt spreading. The Indian problem, apart from the Northeast, is not that of nation, it is that of class caste. And those are the two major dividers of humanity. I was mediating twice in Nepal. 14 hours a day, seven days a week. Maoists, royalists, and seven not very useful political parties lined up. And one thing that struck me about the Maoists where they were doing so much better than the Naxalites, was their ability to have a 40-point program formulated not in Marxist jargon, but in very plain terms, appealing to very many. There was one person I didn't meet. He was the chief of police of Nepal. He called me the day I was leaving, asking whether we could have breakfast at the airport. And he said, my task is to eliminate the Maoists. 
My problem is that I believe in 39 of the 40 points. Can you help me? Now, I, of course, got very curious, which is point number 40 that you don't like? You know, that's a fantastic way of making propaganda for something, is that you have a sentence like that. He said, they want to get rid of the monarchy, we have to have some monarch. So I said, as a good Scandinavian, how about constitutional monarchy? Mm -hmm, that tastes good. Now, we all know what happened. But not everybody is aware of the fact that these 40 points came in 1996 as an ultimatum. They were rejected. In came 10 years of terrorism and state terrorism. Suddenly, a ceasefire. And 19 days of nonviolence. Gandhiji, thank you. Ramlal, thank you. Because you were the one who always promised. If you do it nonviolently, I guarantee you'll make it. Because nonviolence changes the relation, the other side, and you. All three at the same time. <coughs> 19 days and the king abdicated. If I were a former Zamindari in uh, India, worried about Naxalites, I would hope that I would continue being violent. I would be deadly afraid should they turn nonviolent. The Maoists did. What happened afterwards is a long and complicated story. And one of the 11 conflicts that the Nepal syndrome boils down to was with India. With a very big, somewhat arrogant neighbor. Well, this one is now moving. It did not move nonviolently, but the last phase was nonviolent. So let me finish a very long talk. And I did not go into detail about what I would hope would happen in India. Collective land ownership and private use. To be monitored a distinction between ownership as collective, use as private, but monitored. And the number of ownerships to be expropriated. Monsanto to be driven out of the country. Return to the agriculture that Indian farmers knew. So all of it feasible. But not maybe under the present regime. In other words, search for the underlying conflict. Fight the struggle nonviolently. Listen to the repressed voices. They have messages. The messages are not necessarily pleasant, and some of them are highly unappetizing. Be prepared for the unappetizing. Be prepared for the optimism of a Ramlal Parikh. Ramlal, thank you.